Hi, and welcome back. Today we're introducing a new series of talks with Lewis Kaplan, who, besides being founder of the Aeolian Chamber Players and co-founder of both the Bowdoin Music Festival and the Bach Virtuosi Festival, was my teacher while I studied at Juilliard. Because I always get questions about who I studied with in school, I thought I would share some time that I spent with Mr. Kaplan with you all, learning more about him, but most importantly, digging deeper into the way that he approaches music and Bach in particular, and really influenced my own playing. This will be the first of several episodes, and I urge especially students to tune in because Mr. Kaplan has so much to say and to give. In this first episode, we're talking about the Aeolian Chamber Players, one of the first mixed ensembles to bring contemporary music from the likes of Crum, Shapey, Babbitt, and Davidovsky to the stage. Lastly, I just want to mention that the Bach the Bach Festival kicks off on August 1st in Portland, Maine. So if you are in the area, I highly recommend you to go check it out. There will be some excellent live concerts to attend, and we've all been starved of live music, especially at such a high level. So links are below. Um, if you enjoy this video, remember to like, subscribe, and enjoy. Cheers. Uh, I'm Lewis Kaplan. I'm the former teacher of Catholic Zen. So, hi everyone and welcome back. Today we have a special guest with us. This is Mr. Kaplan, uh, Lewis Kaplan, who I don't think I'll ever be able to call you Lewis in my head. But, um, try. Try, okay. <laughs> I will try. So, Lewis Kaplan, who is here with us to speak today. So, um, I thought we'd dive right in and you started your career kind of out of Juilliard with the Alien Chamber Players, is, is that right? Mm -hmm. And when did that start? When did you start that whole group? Uh, I graduated in 1961, uh -huh. and uh, at that time, of course, there were string quartets, uh, many, and some very good ones, uh, and a few woodwind quintets. But I thought, why shouldn't there be a permanent group that played uh, for mixed instrumentation? Because there was more and more music being written for mixed timbre. Mm -hmm. And so it started with actually a very strange combination, uh, flute, clarinet, violin, and piano. Okay. Uh, and of course, there was no repertoire for that combination. Uh -huh. uh, but we created them, and some of the best works uh, were written for that combination, including a then almost unknown composer named George Crum who wrote the 11 Echoes of Autumn for me, a uh, piece that we recorded, made the first recording of it, and performed it uh, at least 125 times, recorded it for BBC in London, recorded it for Swiss radio uh, in the late 60s. And George then did write another piece. And five years later, we added a cello, so we could do more, some more traditional repertoire. But the idea of aliens was, and this is not original, that music is a continuity and that contemporary music is not something strange out there, but it is a continuation of hundreds of years of music. Uh, and uh, those were some of the most wonderful years, never made any real money doing this, uh, playing concerts and touring. Uh, but the idea of uh, performing this, the excitement of a new work that who knows, what is it going to be? You know, maybe immortality lies around the corner. And uh, he didn't write it for us, but George Crumb uh, did give us the first New York performance and the recording of The Voice of the Whale. Uh, oh, that's a great piece. It is. And, you know, it was really rewarding is after a number of years teaching it to students. So these pieces became a second generation. Right. And, and now it's a third generation. And for those people, especially in the changing world today, I, I think one should have the courage to do what one believes, no matter how crazy you think it is but just do it on the highest possible level. Be a true artist and aim for that. Um, and 
uh, that was just a wonderful, wonderful part of my life, uh, doing AOA and chamber players, playing with marvelous musicians, um, and uh, touring. It was never easy, though. Never easy. Uh, when we first started, uh, I was able to book concerts. Uh, <laughs> very naively making telephone calls out of the blue or just traveling or whatever. That's amazing. And so we're, here we had all of these concerts and after we played Town Hall, this is before Lincoln, before Tully only existed, in 1962. It had wonderful reviews. And in 1964 played again and got the most phenomenal reviews, one ending, uh, I think it was either the Times, the Tribune, long may they play together. And we could not get management. Uh, the original flutist, to tell you how naive or altruistic I was, maybe still am, the original flutist in the group was a classmate of mine. He was black. And when we, I tried to get management and, and they'd see the reviews, then I'd come in and show them a photograph of uh, the group, and they'd take one look and say, what are you, joking? There goes, there goes half the country that we can't book you in. This is oh, the 60s. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they said, well, who ever heard of a flute, a clarinet, a violin? Get out of here. Don't, don't bother me. Uh, and uh, one well-known management said... Um, we can't sign you or book you because the only time that the whole group is playing together is in a modern piece, and that's that's not what we book. Right. Um, but as I said, despite all of this, it was really fantastic. Um, we did uh, have among the right, including the first grants from the uh, National Endowment for the Arts. We did the pilot program for chamber music. I think looking back at those performances, the excitement that I've talked about, uh, this is a, a great part. And I'd say, well, how many people really have this experience? It's a great thing, which really shows money is not everything, because I've made money doing other things, mm -hmm. but it's not this. I can't, I can't imagine. It sounds like you almost really missed that time in a way. You're right, I yeah. do. I do. I think it's, it's a wonderful part of youth, but then again, some people think that I'll never grow up anyway, so, and I do. <laughs> uh, you know, especially if I'm coaching one of these pieces mm -hmm. or teaching a particular student, I do feel very, very young. I feel the excitement, the energy, uh, the desire to give, and, but I feel that it's even more so now because I know a hell of a lot more, never mind than I did in 1961 or two, but even a hell of a lot more than I did five years ago. And so there is, uh, I shouldn't say more than a desire, there's a need to say, I must give this, I must convey this so that it will continue. So there's no slowing down for you? No. No. <laughs> no. Why should there be? <laughs> no, just... Uh, uh, performing uh, much, much, much less, uh, mostly uh, just uh, doing uh, classes on, on Bach. Mm -hmm. The attitude towards contemporary music when you were putting together the Aeolian chamber players, do you think that's really changed in modern times? I mean, now we call it new music rather than contemporary music, and that has a very different connotation, contemporary and new. has. How have you seen that change over time? The 60s were a very exciting time for new ideas mm -hmm. in the United States. Uh, there was not the cynicism, uh, and there was wealth being devoted to the arts. Um, and uh, individual donors, foundations, and the government, New York State Council on the Arts, uh, and as I mentioned, National Endowment for the Arts, um, but more than that, there was an excitement about new music, and there was a certain focus. Okay, there were 12 toners, and there were uh, third stream jazz, uh, there was aleatoric music, and they each had their followers. Mm -hmm. 
but they knew what was going on. And when we did this first concert in Town Hall in 1962, we were premiering a work by Ralph Shapey, who has, uh, has always had a very, very difficult time. Uh, but in the audience uh, was Edgar Varese, was Milton Babbitt, uh, I think Mario Davidovsky was there. It was a who's who coming to hear Ralph Shapey, of course, but maybe partially to hear a new group play. Um, and as far as I can see, this uh, hopeful, this optimism exists only in very few people today. It, it's not as widespread as it was then. Um, also, too, there were many concert series in colleges, which is primarily where we were playing, and or even on a chamber music series. But let's say there were five concerts. Uh, three would be string quartets. Uh, one might be a piano trio. And then maybe you get something like the Airlands or something a little more right. offbeat. Th those series hardly exist anymore. So that is how we were able to put together touring, uh, and, and both here and, and in Europe when we toured abroad. That's a really tough route. <laughs> well, today, I know that in various series, uh, where it would be the five, like I've just mentioned, uh, now it's one classical music. Yeah, and exactly. And <laughs> the other is various forms of pop or theater. But I do enjoy, among the things that we did, um, and this would have gone back to the 60s, was performing George Crumb in a blue light. So this was more the beginnings of a mixed media. Mm -hmm. It was theatrical. But I, we were doing electronic music, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was very exciting to me. I really loved the idea. The first work written for us was Morton Sabotnik, who okay. was a hot number then. And it was for electronics and the aliens and live instruments. And there were... There was no comp composing as there is now where you just sit at the keyboard and compose. Mm -hmm. I mean, every sound was a laborious act. Okay, it took right. lots and lots of time. And so we had to synchronize with uh, Subotnik's work and, uh, and, and doing the live part. Uh, and there was an audience for it. But I'm, I'm still now very involved with the idea of mixed media. Oh, and we did offbeat concerts. I'll never forget, we did one at the Whitney Museum, and uh, I said to the guy who was running it, uh, I'd like, instead of chairs, just cushions, and people will sit on the floor. And he said, come on, you know, this will never sell. This, forget it. I said, no, we got to do it. He said, if this sells, I'll eat my hat. Well, the line outside the Whitney, Whitney Museum to buy tickets was around the corner. And it was absolutely full, great concert. And at the intermission, this manager running the series came back with a hat chewing on it. <laughs> but, I mean, these, these were exciting ideas. These yeah. were exciting times. And of course, for many, many years, I met people around the world who said, I heard you live here, or I heard your recording of this. And, and what... Nobody ever heard of a flute, a clarinet, a violin, and a piano. Fifteen years later, ten years later, there were more mixed groups of various kinds in the Western quartets. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And then you still see them whenever I see um, the CAG awards. Or there's always plenty of mixed groups that mm -hmm. are that are um, winning these things. So mm -hmm. you sort of started, got that ball rolling. I, <laughs> I did. Yeah.